Hello and welcome everyone to an exciting edition of Astronomy Days. We're here again with you for another program. Welcome to the final day of Astronomy Days here at the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's good to be with you all again. We've got another day's worth of exciting, great presentations set up for you. So thanks for being here with us this morning. And I hope that we'll see you throughout the day uh, to learn more great astronomy, astrophysics, cool space stuff with us. Uh, as we get started and as we get settled, I've got a question for everybody. Have you ever been bothered by the light from a neighbor's house or residence or a business? Like, have you ever gone outside and tried to look up at the sky, but there were just bright lights all around you? Let me know. Type up your answer in the chat on YouTube, or if you're joining us here on Zoom, let us know if you've ever been bothered by some some extra light leaking into your space. I know uh, the answer to that question for me, but I think we're going to get into the answers in just a little bit. To get started for today's program, I do want to go over uh, how to use the Zoom. I think maybe folks are pretty familiar with it, but we do have some great accessibility features available to you today that you can take advantage of if you'd like. So first off, everyone's camera and audio will be turned off for today's program. There's a button down at the bottom middle of the screen for closed captions. If you wanna take advantage of those, click that and then click show subtitles. You can also adjust the settings for the subtitles for the captions so that you can change the font size and things like that so that you have the best experience using that feature. We do have live captions available to you for that reason. Now, the best way we think that you can experience our programs is to use speaker view. Click the button in the top right corner of your Zoom screen and make sure that it says speaker view. And then use the view options button and change your view to side by side mode. That way you can see the presentation and the guest speaker all at once on your screen and won't be obscuring the presentation at all. We think that's that's really the best way to watch. And then, of course, all of our Astronomy Days programs are interactive. We want to know what your thoughts, comments, and questions are too. So make sure that you are dropping those into the chat here on Zoom or into the chat on YouTube. We have moderators standing by ready to send us those questions when we get to the question and answer segment towards the end of the program. And we'll have a nice conversation dialogue with all of you about today's topic. Uh, and today's topic is one that I'm pretty interested in because I do have quite a bit of experience with light pollution and trying to observe the nighttime sky, but not being able to see much. I've got one great story. Maybe when we get there, I, I can share it uh, a little bit. When, when Dan, Dr. Caden, you might like this story when we get to it. But to introduce our guest, we have another special guest. Everybody, I want you to meet the head of the Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Lab here at the museum and a professor at Appalachian State University, Dr. Rachel Smith. Thank you, Chris. Not such a special guest. I am just a regular museum person, but thank you for that. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to do a brief introduction for my good friend, actually, and um, a colleague at Appalachian State University, Dr. Dan Caton. And he is uh, one of um, the experts on light pollution and has a really interesting talk to share with you all about that. And um, just a brief background, he's not only a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at App State, where I'm also uh, faculty. He's also the director of observatories, and there is an observatory uh, near uh, the campus called Dark Sky Observatory. If you ever get a chance to go, it's a great observatory, has a visitor center, and in non-COVID times, Dr. Caton does um, public talks there, so that's really fun, um, and you can search online for those. Uh, he is from Tampa, Florida, nice and warm there, uh, and attended the University of South Florida, uh, and he graduated there with a bachelor's in astronomy and physics. Uh, he got a master's there as well, and then um, went to uh, move to Gainesville uh, 
through the University of Florida Gainesville, where he got his PhD in astronomy. He's the founding president of the North Carolina section of the International Dark Sky Association. He, re he works actively to reduce light pollution in the state. And as astronomers know, we have, um, as humans continue to populate this earth, we continue to brighten up our planet. So he's gonna tell us about that. Um, he has done uh, lots of TV appearances. I won't list them all, but you can look him up online. And he is also, he has spoken before on the Brown Mountain Lights. So you might want to ask him about those, some interesting non-alien uh, phenomena, so he says. But uh, but anyway, uh, I will now hand things off to Dr. Dan Caton. So thank you. And take it away, Dan. Thanks, uh, Rachel. I appreciate the introduction. So um, we're, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to do a little background uh, uh, discussion of the general nature of light pollution and look at some new things that have appeared in the last few years that have become an additional concern. Um, so Rachel mentioned, I, I belong to the Dark Sky Association. I run the North Carolina section and I'm a member of the American Astronomical Society's Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Interference, and Space Debris. So this pollution goes across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Um, let's see here. Um, this is a little bit awkward. Okay, so what we're going to discuss, the basics, then two of the new things that have appeared in the last few years to several years, uh, the problem with LEDs. Uh, they're wonderful uh, light replacements, but they carry some problems of their own. And the threat of internet uh, satellite constellations, uh, large numbers of satellites being launched to provide uh, internet service. Um, a warning, uh, I, I will ruin the nightscape for some of you. That's my objective. I hope that after this, uh, if you are unfamiliar with this, you won't look at your, your town or uh, city skies the same way again and uh and so this is just a, a a spoiler alert um so um and i don't mean to offend, offend anyone if there are any business people out there who own a business that has uh poor lighting uh that's common most of the lighting installations that are still in place and this country, in fact, worldwide, were not designed. They were just installed, just put up, just specified. Uh, so design is, is uh, becoming more and more common. Basic problem is light from uh, fixtures reflects all particles in the sky, the so-called sky glow. Uh, large cities are visible from tens of miles if you're in the Raleigh area and approach it at night. Uh, from uh, interstate or something, uh, you, you can see the bubble of uh, still mostly yellow sodium vapor light glow for tens of miles. Uh, the stars are not brighter here out you know, where I am in the, in the country in Boone. Uh, the sky is darker. Uh, so it's really a matter of uh, contrast. And so we, we need to darken the skies in order to see the, the stars that are the same brightness essentially everywhere. My first concern that got me into this was our dark sky observatory that Rachel uh, mentioned. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to dso.appstate.edu and explore our website. Uh, so I was worried about protecting that from the light from Boone, uh, North Wilkesboro, uh, West Jefferson, Jefferson, and other areas. Um, but it's more than just professional astronomers who are concerned. There are, uh, probably about 100,000 hobbyist amateur astronomers in the uh, U.S. alone. And for these people, this is their hobby. Uh, this is their, that they, most of the telescopes in this view were home built. Uh, this is their bass boat. This is their, what they do with their free time. Uh, unfortunately, they also go out to uh, these star parties like uh, Mid-Atlantic Star Party. This was back in Robbinsville. Uh, some years ago, and, and they gather and, and they, they flee their towns and they go home and they don't do anything about their home light pollution. And we astronomers, professional astronomers, are equally guilty of this, by the way. Uh, we go off to our remote observatories and then we come back home and we don't do anything about the bubbles of light that are increasing. Just as important, stars are part of the, the, the social fabric um, and, and it's embedded in music and art. I've often thought that it'd be an interesting um, music history 
mm, student thesis project to see if the references to stars has disappeared with the increase in light pollution. Here's the global problem. Um, you can see the where where people live by base basically by the lighting. This is a collect this is a collage of images put together on clear nights in all different areas, and you can see uh, the areas where there aren't many people, the Sahara and the uh, eastern uh, uh, western part of China, uh, and so and the and deep in the Amazon and so forth. So um, this is uh, what we have. Zooming in closer to the U.S., you can see again uh, most uh, the people are either in the eastern half of the U.S. or over in California, and there are little spots of population between. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, you can see this is um, Phoenix, Arizona, and how bright it is, and uh, Tucson down here, much fainter. They've had a lighting ordinance for, uh, it must be about a half a century now. And so that's because the National Observatory is too, uh, Kit Peak is over here, and they've been protecting uh, the sky for a long time. The IDA grew out of there. Um, so what's wrong with this picture? So this is a picture from August 2003. And if you look uh, carefully at it, uh, you'll notice there's a chunk of light missing. So this was a power failure where uh, one utility went down. And because uh, most of the nation is, is interconnected on power, uh, it dragged down and threw breakers and equipment on a large area in the Northeast. And at this point, sadly enough, a lot of people, maybe even kids, uh, saw the night sky for the first time ever. Um, and in fact, over in California, I know talking to people when they uh, take kids out, say inner city kids that don't have many opportunities, they take them out on a field trip in the desert to look at the night sky. They have to social engineer it. They have to tell them what they're going to see or they'll be frightened at the night sky, which is a sad comment. Closer to home, I'm over here in Boone. This is a pretty dark area of our state. Uh, uh, Raleigh, not so much. Uh, in fact, there are, there are little dark pockets here and there, but uh, so you can you can follow the interstates and you can find the, the city or town of your, your choice. In Boone, this was a picture taken by one of the first Appalachian State photographers, John Dinkins, um, um, 50, 50 or 60 years ago. This, slide caption is getting a little dated. And he, he went up to a peak overlooking Boone and took, took a picture which has poor color because it's very old, um, I think a Kodachrome slide that he gave me. Uh, and you can see the modest lighting. Um, maybe 25 years ago, um, I took this same picture from the same location and you can see how much the light has grown. Uh, there's a few stars competing uh, with the light pollution. This is the light from our stadium. So uh, this is a problem that's bad. I need to go up there again and take another photo and it's on my list to do. Um, so where does sky glow, glow come from? Poor fixture design, light fixtures, especially older ones were not designed with light pollution in mind. Lack, they lack shielding um, and over lighting. There's this crime dog McGruff uh, uh, viewpoint that, well, if a little light is good, a lot of light is better. Well, no. Uh, if a little light is good, better light is better. And there's a difference. And so um, they're often poorly installed, uh, aiming uh, too high and so forth. And market pressure, there are companies that will come around, take a picture of your old gas station, put it in Photoshop, jack up the lighting, and then sell you a bright light package. So and then you're competing with the gas station across the street and so forth. Uh, one of the worst fixtures, uh, one of the public enemy number one uh, is the floodlight. You can see this rig is, the light is facing this way. It's almost horizontal. Uh, that one is certainly horizontal. This one's not much better and so forth. Uh, these are cheap and easy, stuck on utility poles that are mostly already existing and often leased from the power company. Uh, so there's no shielding, and at night they're very glaring. This was a picture of our McDonald's restaurants uh, several years ago, um, and you can see they were using floodlights on the corners, uh, leased ironically by the University of New, New River Light and Power, and uh, kind of flooding the area, <laughs> that's the name, uh, and the sky as well. 
Um, so a better alternative to this is so-called full cutoff fixture. And that has nothing to do with throwing a switch. It has to do with the fact that the bottom of the, the fixture is flat. Uh, there's no light that goes above the hori its horizon. And so uh, they're also sort of called a shoebox design for obvious reasons. Why do you think these are chosen? Because they want to protect the sky? No, most of the time because of the appearance of the fixture in the daytime. This is prettier looking than this big shiny metal thing. Uh, at night though, um, these are uh, a lot better. So here's our same McDonald's. Um, took this picture a few years ago after uh, Boone passed the lighting ordinance and uh, the ordinance requires you to come up to the st new standard if you renovate to 10% of the value of the property, which is hard not to do. And so you, they took those floods down and they have these nice full cutoff lights. Uh, and one of the features of full cutoff uh, fixtures is you don't really hardly notice the fixture, but you do notice the poles because you don't see the glare of, of the fixture itself shutting your eyes down. It has some facade lighting, which is also controlled. Uh, but I'll give you facade lighting if you'll give me the main problem. And so that's that's what is much better looking uh, place. Uh, another example of poor lights for acorn fixtures or globes. Um, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, uh, more light uh, literally goes up than down because they're supported from below. And that means uh, this casts a shadow. In fact, there's a dark uh, insecure area right below the fixture. Billboards are often lit the wrong way. They're uplighted as in this example. Um, you don't have to be a physicist uh, to uh, re realize that uh, this is not a, a good thing because most lights reflect it off uh, and goes up into the sky, most of the light. All you have to have done is play billiards or know the law of reflection of light and you realize this is not very good. And they're often on all night with nobody actually seeing them. Roadway lighting, here's, I mentioned cobra head fixtures, shaped sort of like a cobra head. And these are, uh, these are typical, they're glaring to drivers. The filament uh, is below the fixtures horizon. So 15, 20% of light goes up in the sky. Um, so these are, are not very good. Better are full cutoff fixtures, streetway fixtures. This has become the standard in, in state roads. Uh, the NC DOT went to full cutoff some time ago. Uh, there are other entities like uh, Duke Power, if you ask for a private uh, security light, they'll deliver a full cutoff fixture like this now. So that's, that's a better fixture. Then there's security lighting. So we have this dusted on fixture on a pole, often leased from the power company or provided by the power company as some kind of uh, area lighting. Uh, they're on all night. Uh, there's a question whether this provides security or is it a lighthouse that says, hey, I'm over here, come burglarize me. Uh, because it turns out, you know, if you live, especially in a dark area, rural area, and you have one of these and a ne'er-do-well driving by wouldn't even know you were there if you didn't have it. So there's, uh, and a meta study, a study of studies some years ago uh, said they could not conclude whether it provided benefit and it is security or they provided benefit to like the work workspace for the burglar. So uh, the, the jury's out on that. Uh, the refractor in it, plastic globe below it is very glaring, light polluting. And uh, frequent light trests uh, and, and neighbor problem. And so that was the lead in question and uh, uh, that you were asked in the chat. Maybe Chris could chime in there and see, tell me about what the number was, the fraction. Uh, the fraction was 100 out of 100, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody who was here said yes, yep. light pollution at their home, light bleeding into their space was a problem. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it, and, and if you don't have an ordinance, you can't do anything about it. Um, and uh, even Boone's ordinance does not protect um, residential lighting. It, it's a can of worms and neighbor problems are always a can of worms. There's just 
no easy solution. I'll show you a, a dramatic solution at the end here. These are also installed by amateurs who buy them, you know, homeowners buy them at, at Home Depot or Lowe's and put them up. You can't even buy one of those. It's illegal to sell them in Pima County, Arizona, where Tucson is, uh, because they're so egregious. Um, so that's a problem. Here's a, a joking example. I took this picture a number of years ago. Uh, this, this old gas station had been purchased by someone who uh, turned it into a residence. And, and there's the old 1960s or 70s, 80s era fluorescent tube uh, gull wing uh, reflector fixtures. It had fluorescent tubes in them and, and those were not working. They put in a, a light they bought. And of course you see it doesn't really light a whole lot blow because these shields block it. It does like their bedrooms, which is not a good thing, as we'll talk about. And as some of you have indicated, you have that light coming in your bedroom. Uh, a related uh, or a new issue related that's related to all this actually is uh, conversion of street lights to LEDs. LEDs are wonderful. They're very efficient. Um, they're not um, extremely more efficient than some kinds of lighting like low pressure sodium, but uh, they are, in general, more efficient than what's commonly out there, high-pressure sodium, which is the orangish, light orangish color. Um, and I got a complaint from a resident in Boone, and I went out and got a, a spectrum of it, a little handheld uh, spectrometer that talks to my phone and gives me the data. And this is the, uh, the spectrum of it from violet to, to red. And you see this big blue spike. And this is, this is what you get in, um, in the physics of LEDs. There's really no way around it. You can filter it out or you can do something else and we'll look at that. And this has a high, what we call a color temperature. If you're a photographer, you might be somewhat familiar with that term. Uh, and astronomy wise, this is actually like the temperature of the surface of a star. A temperature of uh, the, the spectrum of a star of 3,700 Kelvin, which is a uh, medium, uh, cool, warm star would have a spectrum a lot like this. It wouldn't have the blue spike, though. And so this blue spike is not a good thing. Also, in astronomy, this scatters. At night, this blue spike scatters preferentially just like the sunlight. sunlight's blue component in the sun spectrum is scattered over the whole sky multiple times so that no matter where you look during the day, you see a blue sky. So our atmosphere is preferentially scatters blue, and at night it's scattering this stuff, and that's bad for light pollution. But for people, here's the here is the problem. There's that blue spike, and here is your daytime light sensitivity, the solid curve, and it nicely lines lines up with uh, uh, this wavelength, which is the greenish area. Uh, that's where our sun spectrum peaks. So we have evolved to see where there's light to be seen. If you could see x-rays like Superman, wonderful, but uh, there are not much x-rays getting to us from the sun. So we see what's to be seen in the day, and there we are. At night, it shifts into the red. I mean, I'm sorry, into the blue. And here's that blue spike. And so if you've been annoyed by those blue headlights coming at you, yep, that's why. Your eyes really don't want to see that. Uh, they're too sensitive to it at, at night. So... Uh, health concerns, uh, some of that started with um, uh, sea turtles, protecting sea turtles. This is a, a, in Carolina Beach, took this several years ago. Uh, this a group of uh, people protect the turtles and they mark the nest when the mama waddles out and lays them and they stake it off and then it's federally protected. And then a couple months later, the turtles are born and they, they have dug a trench to guide them out so they are not attracted to that light over there. Um, so there is some effort on the coast to do that, to protect that. And, uh, uh, but for people, uh, the risk turns out to be cancer uh, because your melatonin production is interrupted by blue light. Uh, and, and so if that, that fixture is bleeding light into your bedroom, and particularly if it's an LED because it has that blue spike, uh, that's not a good thing. So this was realized when someone noticed a couple of decades ago that um, blind women have a lower incidence of breast cancer than sighted women. So you had to figure this out, right? And what they found was that blind women's body, uh, they don't know that it's not always night. And so their bodies make melatonin all the time. 
uh, the melatonin is that natural ingredient your body produces, or you can buy on the off the counter for a supplement uh, that uh, makes you drowsy and you 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 go to sleep. It starts to kick in mid late evening, and the production goes through. Well, it turns out you can't. That's uh, uh, the melatonin is also an antioxidant in the anti cancer cycle, and that's why the blind women uh, have a lower rate of cancer. If their bodies are always making melatonin. Um, and it also means the flip side of that is if you interrupt your life with bright blue light uh, in, in dark hours, that's, that's not that's an accumulator risk for you, and you don't want to do that. Um, so uh, you can protect yourself uh, if you go into settings. Uh, if you have an iPhone, there's a, a, a setting uh, called uh, Night Shift, and you can schedule it to go reddish. Uh, and you can adjust how warm it is, how reddish it is. You think that's annoying, but you get used to it. It's not really obvious. And after you, after you get used to it, it's not a problem. If you have an Android, um, I don't have one, but I, I grab this offline. There's, there's a setting. You can go into settings and uh, find nightlight, and you can do a similar uh, adjustment. If you have a Windows PC, uh, there's a setting. You can just search for nightlight. You can adjust it, and you can have it automatically come in at sunrise, sunset, or set the hours in the day, and how red. These all have that ability. And uh, on a PowerBook or Mac, there's also a built-in uh, uh, setting that you can do called Night Shift. So these manufacturers know of the problem, and this has been in these for a few years. So uh, you should do this. You don't want to, in the middle of the night, uh, have that phone react and look at that bright white screen. Your, your circadian rhythm, your, your melatonin production is now turned off for a couple hours. And if you accumulated a lifetime of that, you could present yourself with danger. For indoor lights, there's also a solution. Um, and this is actually becoming available for outdoor fixtures as well. It's called uh, phosphor converted amber. And here's a spectrum I took of um, actually some of these bulbs in my own house and you see the blue spike is just about gone well where'd it go they don't filter it they cleverly the inside these are is a led and then the bulb is coated with a phosphor that preferentially receives this blue light and sh and re-emits it in the yellow orange and these have a wonderful warm feeling uh and they and they don't have that blue spike that, that bothers you they have a very cool uh, color temperature. 2300 Kelvin is nearly ideal. This is what the IDA would like all outdoor lighting to be like. So these are on all night in your house. If you convert it to LEDs, great, but great for your power, but uh, they, they have that blue spike unless they're a PCA bulb. Um, this is more than annoying at, uh, at hotels and one of the chat chatters I mentioned uh, having to have uh, light blocking curtains. And so Hotels often use floodlights, which are like behind me facing this facade, and, and they light up their building for free advertising. Come stay here. Oh, yeah, and we're going to provide light blocking curtains because of our own lighting. Um, car sales lots are often grossly overlit, uh, and uh, they're on all night. They use unfriendly metal halide lamps. These are those big uh, metal reflector things in big box stores and grocery stores some of which grocery stores are going over to LEDs. But if you see these big um, reflectors with bright white lights, that's what they are. Uh, they also have restart problems. So they light stadiums with them. And if there's, an, if there's a power glitch, uh, it takes 10 or 15 minutes to um, before they cool off and you can turn them back on. So these car lots can be done nice at at night, this is full cutoff. Again, you notice I see the poles and I don't see the glaring fixtures at all. And I see nicely lit sales lot. Wall packs are one of the worst fixtures for light pollution. They're essentially floodlights uh, made to bolt on the wall where you already have power. So it's cheap and easy to do the install. Uh, they are available in full cutoff though. These are not, these are. Here we have the moon competing for a little attention in the right photo. Wall packs or floods are often used in ATMs. That's a national joke in, in the in the dark sky movement. These things are in your face. Um, as you approach this machine, um, can you can 
you could you see a perpetrator? Well, not really, because this glares your eyes. It's shutting down your the size of your iris, and that leaves you with reduced uh, visibility. A lot of people naively think that seeing the bright light is safety, but it's not. That's it's the opposite. This shuts down your eye, leaving less vision to see the rest of the things. But the perpetrator can see you if he's hiding back there in the corner. He's got a wonderful front lit view of you. So, um, yeah, not a good thing. Sports lighting is usually done poor with lots of light pollution and light trespass, but there's better uh, fixtures available. This a baseball field has a few lights just barely in view. Again, I see the poles. I can see the lights on the well-lit field, but uh, not really any light pollution. Um, modern sports lighting has become excellent with a sharp, these are LED units with a sharp cutoff, so they do not have much light trespass into the neighborhood. Uh, so here's some sample fixtures, um, a GE fixture uh, with a, a, a baseball kind of brim. And uh, uh, here's the same kind of thing by Musco uh, brims and little sub reflectors. The brims protect the sky, the sub reflectors stop light trespass into the neighborhood. Musco is a big a leader in this. Musco lights all the NASCAR tracks. Uh, expensive. It's about a million dollars a mile to light a NASCAR track where you're not blinding people or the drivers. Uh, and uh, so this uh, fixture, uh, I saw this vendor and said, hey, you ought to talk to Watauga County. They're building a new high school. And they have to meet the lighting ordinance, which requires light control packages. And he said, okay, yeah, we will. And they did. And that's what um, what Watauga High got, uh, but he said, but your university just bought a ton of lighting and they didn't buy this, so it was too late on that. Uh, we won a few championships, the ESPN had rolled into town and relighting the stadium had come up on the top of the list without my knowledge, so I missed the ball there. Watauga High, this was when it was being built. You can see they're not aimed yet, but you can see the reflectors. Um, gas station canopies, are often egregiously overlit. Uh, so this was part of the Boone Ordinance uh, that Boone Ordinance grandfathered in all the bad lighting and it has to be replaced if you if it changes ownership, changes business type, or renovated 10% of value. Uh, but these are the only things that had a sunset provision. Uh, seven long years uh, to come down to uh, a reasonable lighting value. Uh, they picked seven years because that period of time and were worked uh, previously when Boone banned off-premise billboards. So there no giant billboards in Boone, all signages on, prop on the uh, business property and it's controlled in size. Uh, compared to this, uh, so this, this is six foot candles, uh, amazingly low. And, and for a dark environment, this was about this uh, specification the standard you were supposed to meet. A foot candle is originally historically was the light uh, you see from a candle uh, lighting a surface one foot away. Um, and uh, it's, that's been standardized into real units now, but um, give you an idea, sunlight, bright sunlight is 10,000 foot candles, bright daylight is 1,000, overcast day 100. Uh, in your, where you ever you are now or uh, at where you work there in the tens of foot candle range, twilight is 0.1 to 1. And full moon is only 0.01 foot candles. So this, it, it can be done right. Uh, I have to, this one re relit, it used to be 60 foot candles, then it's six. And now I happened to measure it the other day and they've relit it with LEDs and they're out of compliance. They are like, 40 foot candles and the limit is 30. So I'll be contacting the town because first I need to measure the other 18 to 20 gas stations. Um, so another new threat are internet satellites, constellations, packets, groups, fleets of these things being launched at a time. This is Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX's Starlink satellites. And this is a, a picture of the night sky of time exposure, uh, maybe 20 or 30 minutes, maybe uh, something like that. So the stars have made little arcs because the earth is rotating under them. Here's the north, here's above the North Pole. So the stars are circling there. And these streaks are a launch uh, of um, a fleet of new satellites to provide internet 
Um, and this has taken over uh, our AAS committee. It took it over out of nowhere two years ago. We're still spending most of our time on that, which is not good. I've had some random experiences. I can't prove that these are Starlinks, but I didn't used to get this frequent. Here's four images uh, from four different nights. These are from Facebook posts that I made when I was starting to get irritated. Um, because I used to randomly see these once in a while. So I have a stellar field and here's a streak from some kind of satellite. And I just, I walk into the computer room, the library of my home, remote observing. And I, and I just noticed these and I, and I'm walking in seeing one image out of a hundred, you know, every now and then, and there, it just became a lot more frequent. So it's, it's not a good thing. It's going to mess up professional astronomy. Um, Starlink wants to launch 42,000 of these. There's just now I think, a couple thousand up there about that. Amazon has plans. Uh, OneWeb is a company that was going to launch satellites. They, um, they went bankrupt and then because they had an FCC or FAA permit, when they did so, they came back from the dead um, because of that value. And so they're back. Uh, so maybe a total of like 100,000 plan. And this is a problem in light pollution and their radio sources. So for radio telescopes, radio interference, and they have a lifetime of five to seven years. So then point, they become space debris. And our committee has been totally absorbed by this. We've neglected ground-based light pollution for the last two years, and some of us are realizing that. Uh, to their credit, Elon tried to fix it, dark set, uh, they painted it dark, but thermal control in space is, is hard to do. So these absorb too much sunlight and the, the satellite got hot. These, by the way, are like a, a yard by three yards long. These are not little guys. This photo is deceptive. Then they have visor set, had uh, mechanically controlled visors to, to block the sunlight. And those uh, made an improvement, but I'm not sure. I don't have inside word whether that's what they're launching now. So the Starlink home system for internet, this is not going to talk to your phone. This is, requires a dish to see it. Um, has 50 to 150 megabits down, 10 to 25 megabits up. So this is downloading movies and watching things. And this is you clicking and uploading and zooming and pushing your video. Compares to Spectrum, uh, which is one source. Um, um, it has a 30 millisecond latency, very short delay because it's in low Earth orbit, 550 kilometers. Um, and uh, Hughes and Viaset previous technology is up way up and has a long delay. I'm not a gamer, but if you're a gamer, this is almost one second delay. You click and one second later, uh, it knows about what you did. And then another second, you see the result. Not a good thing. Uh, Starlink, eh, 500 bucks for equipment, $100 a month for service. Um, and the dish has a warmer built into it. So I have direct TV and I'm familiar with problem with snow and ice. Uh, there is a cat problem on that. So cats like it. So you'll have to protect your dish uh, if it's snowbound here from cats. Um, uh, it's pretty hard for me to do. Okay. Uh, but this is the best option compared to DSL or nothing. There's the so-called last mile problem. If you're the last mile in out a rural area and you want internet, you're going to pay tens of thousands of dollars for that company to bring it in. Uh, so it is an option for that. Um, we're not going to stop bigs. We can only hope to work with them to, uh, to get them to darken the satellite somehow. How you can help with light pollution, look at your own lights. Are they needed? Could you have a cap? Put it on a switch, timer, or motion sensors are better for security. Your outdoor light comes on when a burglar is approaching. They don't know if you switched it on or whether it knows you're there. Uh, lower wattage bulbs. Uh, you could complain at businesses you go to that have bad lighting. Uh, if they're roadside lights that bother you as you drive, you can complain. A neighbor problem, those are the most difficult. Good luck. Um, I was involved in, in a neighbor problem that was uh, uh, came to legal 
means. Um, and um, in this, that case, I was brought in as expert witness. In this case, by the plaintiff's attorney, his properties in uh, suburban Wilmington, North Carolina. The homeowners association put in a light that um, had to put in a light to light up some mailboxes, but they overdid it. Uh, this is the moon. The moon is contributing none of the light on the facades of these buildings. I'll show another view in a moment. Um, so I was contacted to uh, be a, uh, a uh, expert witness in this, and I did that. Um, another view. Uh, all the the light from is coming from behind me. All this light is from that. It lit up their hot tub and night. They had bought this into the cul-de-sac lot and and put the house on it just for the darkness and light enters the bedrooms. Um, so it just was not a good thing. Um, so this is the, the fixture that they had Duke Power put in, a regular roadway fixture, hot 4,000 Kelvin CC, uh, color, correlated color temperature LED, uh, a, a inappropriate beam pattern that spread into the neighborhood uh, and the neighbors and uh, in addition to lighting, over lighting the mailboxes. Um, and here's the view of that from the neighbor. And um, you can see the blue spike. I didn't make a measurement of this. But, um, I didn't have my measuring device at the time, but I got the spec sheet on that fixture and that's, that's what it has, it's typical. Uh, so I provided photos and evidence and measurements that I made to the attorney and Medical reference, AMA, American Medical Association, has a white paper on the dangers of uh, light at night. Um, uh, I provided uh, the information on this uh, five principles for responsible outdoor lighting. This was co-produced by the IDA, Dark Side Association, and Illuminating Engineering Society, which is the American uh, group that provides lighting standards for the U.S., and it violated every one of these every one of these principles is violated by this fixture. And I gave my, I rendered my opinion on it. The realtor uh, surveyed 30 potential home buyers and asked them, would you buy this? And like 25 of them said no. And five of them or so said uh, only with a, a lowered offer. Uh, so the result, they settled, didn't go to court. This was a year ago during pre-vaccine COVID. I'm glad we didn't go to court um, and we won, but it was expensive. So if you're thinking about suing your neighbor after the fact, the attorney said, and he said I could share his contact info, which I haven't done yet, but uh, it can be five figures. And in this case, it was six. So it's an expensive litigation, uh, but they won. The light was removed, replaced with something more civilized. Um, uh, what's going on? Okay. So as a street light shines your window, you can call up to your utility and ask them to replace it or sh sh oh, I misspelled it, shield it. Um, uh, you can write letters to your newspaper and get attention. You can teach your friends about good and bad lighting, point it out to them when you're at, with them at night, spoil their view. Uh, you now know uh, if this is your introduction to light pollution, you know 99 you know more than 99% of the people you'll encounter. It's all an education issue, really. Um, and you can go to darksky.org, and there's lots of information there. I think they used to have, they used to have an information sheet on dealing with neighbors. Uh, they must have some form of it now. And you can become more of an expert. You can join the IDA. Uh, you can develop a local ordinance in your hometown. Small towns like Boone, you could do well, just starting with our code, which you can find online. Uh, larger cities need more elaborate control. Uh, the Dark Sky Association's model lighting ordinance can be used as a template to write your own code. Um, I, I, and uh, right now, as I speak, Hendersonville, North Carolina is doing that. Um, I, I, I didn't particularly like their approach. The MLO is... Um, uh, prescriptive, that is, um, here, uh, you know, you've got to, you got to 
have so many lumens per acre of lighting and, and no more. Uh, Boone's uh, uh, doesn't, it, Boone specifies the lighting levels and it's easier to monitor and check and maintain. Uh, but anything is better than nothing and you can always amend it later. So concluding, um, uh, like if you were really attentive, you might've noticed the background on this went from light sodium vapor, vapor orange to black toward the end. Uh, so you can make that, make that bad lighting go away. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dan. Very interesting stuff. Uh, and a topic that I myself think about quite a bit and my night skies get spoiled all the time <laughs> probably because i like her i think you've done this presentation once or twice before for us at astronomy days this isn't your first go around Is that at true? astronomy days i don't remember and uh <laughs> and uh, or uh, maybe it was just last year but um I, I at least or it was a part of another presentation i don't really recall but i've heard you talk about Dark Skies and the Dark Sky Association and your work out uh, in the western part of the state on this before. And yeah, my night sky has been ruined ever since because all I do now is notice <laughs> notice like bad street lights and blue lights that are up on poles and uh, and just makes me want to write letters. Okay. So uh, let's see. Yeah. There, there are some questions coming into the chat for you, too. I'm going to remind everybody uh, that if you've got questions about anything you saw or heard during the presentation, drop those into the chat uh, and, and we'll ask your questions. But uh, you know what? I want to get started with something because in my mind, I have kind of this thing where I'm not really sure if they can be separated out or if they're two different things. But the difference between sky glow, if you live like, uh, say, near a larger city and you can see that orange halo in the sky that just encompasses the entire city and sky glow from like, you know, the security lights on my neighbor's house. Yeah, uh, that's kind of mixed together. In fact, it reminds me um, that uh, we used to have a retired physician that taught a medical physics course in our department. And he, he came in periodically from his main home in Atlanta. When, one day he asked me, why is the sky so dark in Atlanta? And I had to think about it. And the reason was, is the ambient lighting, the glare from neighboring fixtures was shutting down his eyes. So the sky looked dark, but so were the stars. Uh, if you go to a uh, a store at night, like a grocery store, and then you come out into the parking lot and you've got that glare and you look up, you, you don't, it looks very dark, but you also won't see, even if it's clear, you don't see any stars because your eyes have shut down. So it's a mixture of ambient lighting next to you, uh, which can be harmful. And the sky glow is more of a problem of appreciate, appreciating the stars. But it's all mixed together, and I, I've never seen uh, a fixture that was polluting the sky uh, that was doing its main job correctly. So these go hand in hand. Good lighting for its purpose also protects the sky. So I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, no, yeah, that that definitely did. What what type of street lights are best? I saw. Let's see that in the chat. Uh, the, yep. the, the, the phosphor converted amber is becoming available. Um, and there are lower temperature, regular LEDs. Uh, I, I looked at the spec sheet of this, uh, spec sheets of, of the ones that were involved in this legal case. And there were 3000 Kelvin models available. And those would be a lot better than 4,000. Uh, but your utility is probably putting up 4,000 Kelvin, um, color temperature LEDs, maybe even five. Um, and, and so, you know, you can, you can try to get something, something better. There are better fixtures available. The PCAs are becoming available. Uh, an outstanding uh, example of that is Flagstaff, Arizona has a, they're, they're on the frontier of better development and they require really 
low temperature outdoor lighting. And it's a beautiful place. And Tucson's equally good. Well, not quite as good, but <laughs> okay. Raleigh, on the other hand, no. No. Yeah, it's it's bright out here. Hey, uh, the guy that helped uh, me start the North Carolina section, he, he got sort of got out of the game. Uh, um, he lived in Raleigh. And so we, we had meetings over there and developing. And I, I haven't been able to follow whether Raleigh's done anything. But, if, if, you know, if, if, you, if you approach your town, you usually start with um, uh, the town council. They're usually a planning and inspections and uh, some kind of a appearance quality standards committee or something like that. You start at that level and give them a presentation. If you want this presentation, you send me an email. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. I mean, I, I've given my shows away for a lot of people. And you can tweak it. You can add your own local photos and uh, you approach them. And it, it's... It's never contested. I mean, it's just the fact that people don't do it. Uh, if you if you carry forth a, an ordinance, it's win win. Um, you know, if you do, if you don't have an ordinance and a company comes into your town like uh, uh, Walmart or something and builds, and, and if they see you have a lighting ordinance, they just design to it. It's it's modern design. It's drag and drop fixtures from a catalog onto a a blueprint plat on your screen and it produces isophotes of the lighting and you just tweak things till you've done it. Uh, so there are, people, there are qualified lighting professional designers all around, there are five or six in the Raleigh area alone. Um, and, uh, you know, they can design to it and people just do it. But if they don't, they just put it up. The worst gas station in our county is, is uh, two miles from my house, Quality Plus. They came in, I saw them being built. I called them up, said, What's the deal with the lighting? Said uh, it's going to be 100 foot candles at the slab. And it is. And then they lied. Well, they, they weren't truthful with me. They said, Well, they, they, the guy goes home at 10 p.m. Yeah, but the pumps are self service. Everything's on all night. And it just lights the whole Vilas Valley. Um, but we don't have an ordinance in the county. Uh, so if you have an ordinance, then you have something gives you a, a legal, you know, something more than case law. This thing in Wilmington was case law. They didn't have an ordinance. It was case law. It's based on, you know, what has been successful. And this one was successful. So there's precedent now in the state. But it's an expensive route to go. You Another question that came in. Yeah. Uh, if you live in very light polluted cities, what is the best way to avoid the lights? I, yeah, I saw that question. I don't know exactly. Um, um, I, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that because I'm not quite sure what's being asked. How to avoid the lights for for what? For um, uh, I know I'm thinking like if you're uh, <laughs> you get those uh, light blocking curtains or uh, yeah, I, or yeah, the, not... those glasses that filter blue light. If you're worried yeah. about the not being able to go to sleep or the oh, health yeah. impacts. Yeah. Like in I, a in a really light polluted place. If that's yeah. where you live, that's where you live. Yeah, no, you guys may be doing like you're saying and advocating for better fixtures. Yeah, you can protect yourself and, and and like one of the people who chatted said that they had to put in light blocking curtains and and that's that's just you just have to do that. You do not want to get up and have direct view of that fixture in the middle of the night going to the bathroom, which was the case of one of these homeowners. Uh, it was in his path from his bedroom to bathroom. And it's silly that he has to do this. Um, so, yeah, you, could, you should protect yourself. We, 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 we don't know the exact lighting values that disturb your circadian rhythm. I think we don't know still, but we do know the spectrum. So don't get that cute little blue night LED night light for your bathroom, find a red one. Uh, the blue one, <laughs> that, that doesn't work, that killed you. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, the blue cute ones are widely available. You can find the red ones. There's some nice ones on Amazon you can root around and find. So yeah, protect yourself within your house. And I don't know what, you know, don't go out at night, that's terrible, but don't, don't go look at, at that street light <laughs> after about 10 p.m. Right. So, uh, Shannon has a great question, and we've just got uh, a couple of minutes remaining. Can astrophotographers get LED filters for their telescopes? 
Okay, so astrophotography is a popular, mostly amateur hobby. I've dabbled in that just for fun uh, myself. Uh, it reminds me that you could get light pollution filters for um, sodium vapor lighting. And so they, re they selectively block that part of the spectrum. Uh, I don't know if there's an equivalent for LEDs, but I'm, I'm guessing there is. And you, again, you Google's your friend, go out there or, or look in uh, Sky and Telescope magazine, look, look at the ads in Sky and Telescope magazine, widely available on the newsstands. And, um, and, and there, yeah. if there are products, um, you can probably, you can probably find that. I know Shannon, I think she can find it. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. And I'll, I'll end on this comment from Billy. Lighting the sky is inefficient lighting and costs businesses money. Businesses would be interested in reducing their expenses if they're aware of the costs, maybe too. Sure. LEDs are obviously uh, the way to go, and, and everyone should be replacing their own house lighting with LEDs. But when you do get go on Amazon or whatever, get those PCA bulbs. Um, so businesses can lower their costs. Um, but you know, uh, if you just take the cheapest thing that's available, you're going to get that blue spike. So you have to, you have to specify, um, uh, specify the color temperature. Of, if you specify the color temperature of, of the unit as, um, below 2,800, 2,700 Kelvin, you will automatically get a, a, a better fixture, one with a reduced blue component. Okay. Dr. Caden, thanks for being with us for Astronomy Days. Yeah. Always Thank like you, it. Dan. That was amazing. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Okay. <laughs> and uh, hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in for this first program of Astronomy Days, our last day this Sunday. There's more great programs coming up. Make sure you check out naturalsciences.org slash astrodays to see the remaining programs. And you can go back in the catalog of programs that we've had all week long and go rewatch or uh, find programs that we already hosted to take in and learn something new. There's lots of great stuff on there. I want to thank our Astronomy Day sponsors, the North Carolina Space Grant and Pepsi for bringing this program to you and working with us and our museum members. Please join the museum. There's great perks like getting 10% off of this cool Astronomy Day's Venus-themed T-shirt. So make sure you take advantage of that as well from the museum store. I'll see you again later today. We'll be hosting more programs. Until then, take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.